My name is Susan Joy Hassel, and I've been working in the communication of climate change for 30 years. So really since the beginning of our understanding that climate change was a real and serious problem, I help scientists to com communicate more effectively what we know about the science, because while there are so much expertise in those fields, they're not sometimes the best communicators of that information. They know so much that it's hard for them to remember what it's like not to know it. And so I slow it down and I take out the jargon and I help them communicate what we know in plain language. I also help journalists with their reporting on climate change so they learn more about the issue and how they can communicate about it. Because really climate change isn't just a science story or an environment story. It's a story that involves every single subject that there is, everything we care about, food, water, energy, our health, our safety, our security, you know, the economy, everything. So that's sort of the focus of my work. And um, I'm very passionate about it. I love to talk about climate change and to help people understand it and to understand what we can do about it. So they took 45 pages of just a short summary for policymakers to tell us basically five important things. First of all, it's unequivocal that human activities, that is the burning of coal, oil, and gas, and the clearing of forests are driving global warming. They're, it's causing widespread and unprecedented changes in our atmosphere, our oceans, the land, what scientists call the cryosphere, that is everything frozen, the snow, the ice, the ice sheets, and the biosphere, that is all living things on Earth. Secondly, this human-caused climate change is already exacerbating extreme weather events in every region of the world, including heat waves, droughts, wildfires, heavy precipitation that causes flooding, and tropical storms. And our ability to attribute those events to climate change has strengthened over recent years. Third, we are on track to exceed one and a half degrees Celsius of global warming since the pre-industrial era by 2040, which is about a decade sooner than previous projections. And if we go there, that warming will bring more and stronger heat waves, wildfires, droughts, floods, and storms, the things we're seeing all over the world right now. Fourth, it's not too late if we take immediate and rapid action to reduce our emissions. Those are the heat trapping gases that are causing global warming, the carbon dioxide and methane that comes from the extraction and burning of coal, oil, and gas, and some other things that we can talk about. And if we can do that, we can avoid the most damaging effects. What we've already seen in terms of warming, it's gonna be very hard to take that back to where it used to be, but we can prevent it from getting much worse. So the choice we face is, is it gonna get a little worse or a lot worse? A little worse, we can probably adapt to and deal with a lot worse, and it's probably a global catastrophe. But the good news is that that choice is still in our hands if we act very swiftly and aggressively. The fifth thing that I think is really important for people to understand is that every increment of warming, every tenth of a degree matters in terms of impacts, such as the increases in extreme weather, the severity of the very wet and very dry conditions, how much the ice sheets will melt and sea level will rise, and how much the permafrost will thaw and release methane and carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So every increment matters. It's not as if if we pass 1.5, we're doomed. And if we stay below 1.5, we're safe, because we're not safe. It's already, we are already experiencing dangerous climate change. But how much more we experience, that's what's, that's in our hands, that's up to us. So those I think are the big overarching messages and I've given them to you in plain language, as opposed to some of the language that you'll read in the IPCC report where they're talking about equilibrium climate sensitivity and all kinds of language that the normal person wouldn't understand. But that's basically what they've found. So it's f stronger than ever that we know this is happening. We know why. And it's almost a good thing that we understand that it's human activity because if it was just some 
you know, being hit by a cosmic bus, something we couldn't control, that would be really bad. We know what's causing it, and that empowers us to do something about it. If you're paying attention and if you understand the, these things, you are worried. You can't not be worried. And we should be. We should be very, very concerned, but we should not be paralyzed and frozen into inaction. We shouldn't want to just pull the covers over our heads and not pay attention. Now is the critical moment. We have a window of opportunity, but it's closing. Now is the time to take really strong action. And we know what we need to do. Now we have to summon the leadership and the political will to get it done. So, for example, we know we have to phase out the use of coal, oil, and gas. So one thing we should stop doing immediately is any new fossil fuel infrastructure. We should not be drilling any more oil wells. We should not be digging up any more coal mines. We should not be building any more pipelines because we already have a lot of fossil fuel infrastructure and it's gonna be with us for decades and we're gonna be using those fossil fuels. But if we continue to explore for more fossil fuels and, and building that infrastructure, building more coal and gas fired power plants, that's only gonna make the problem worse and extend it further into the future and it's gonna be expensive. So there's no reason to do that. So no new fossil fuel infrastructure. Instead, invest that money in clean renewable energy like solar and wind. The good news there is that they're actually now the least expensive of all new sources of energy. And we're already on our way. We're not starting from scratch. Most of the new energy coming online now is solar and wind. So all we need to do is speed it up. We need to put our investment into the clean energy of the future rather than the dirty energy of the past. Another bit of good news is that we get immediate health benefits by doing that. You know, we clean up the air, we clean up the water, we send less people to the hospital with asthma. We have way less people, millions less people dying from the complications of air pollution. So there are so many good reasons to rapidly speed up this transition to clean energy. And we need to stop cutting down tropical forests. That's another thing we need to do right now. Because more clearing of forests, more fossil fuel infrastructure, that's moving us in the wrong direction. We need to stop moving in the wrong direction and start rapidly moving in the right direction. So we know what to do. We need to electrify everything. And that's a big deal in transportation. Because right now, a lot of transportation still runs on oil. So our cars, our trucks, our trains, all of that is still running on petroleum. Not all of it. Some of it, especially in Europe where you're doing much better at electric cars, in the US, much slower. We need to electrify transportation and we need to clean up the power grid. That is get the coal and the natural gas out of the power grid, replace them with clean renewable sources of energy. And if we do that, if we stop cutting down the forests, if we, electrify everything, and if we clean up the power grid, we can still do this. We can still avoid the most damaging impacts of climate change and get a host of other benefits at the same time. Everything from job creation to cleaner air to healthier, more walkable communities. There's just no reason not to do it, except the fossil fuel industry is the richest and most powerful industry in the history of humanity. And they have been holding us back for a long time, but we can no longer allow ourselves to be held hostage by the short-term profits of an industry that is sacrificing everything, our future, our health, our safety. You don't have to be a scientist to know that we're experiencing dangerous climate change. Anywhere you are, look out your window, look at your television screen, and you see it. The fires, the floods, the droughts, we can't, we can't continue down this path. Absolutely. We are now seeing play out in front of our eyes what the scientists have been telling us for decades. We know 
that as the average temperature goes up because of these heat trapping gases we've put into the atmosphere, you're going to get more extreme heat, you're going to get heavier rains because a warmer atmosphere holds more moisture. So then when a given storm system comes through, all that moisture dumps out at once. And then because the temperature is higher, you have drier periods in between because that higher air temperature is drying out the soils and the vegetation and evaporating more moisture. So, and that leads to flooding of unprecedented nature. We're seeing floods around the world, the likes of which we've never seen before. So, and then of course, the heat and the drought, especially in places that are already dry, like the US Southwest and other places, you then get the wildfires. And we're seeing that unfortunately play out in so many places, places mostly with a Mediterranean climate like Greece or the Southwest US, we're seeing these terrible fires. So these things are directly linked to climate change. Pretty much everything we're seeing now the extreme heat waves, they're so extreme. Usually we break heat records by like a 10th of a degree or you know, maybe at most half a degree. In recent heat waves, we've broken records by more than 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's just unheard of. And we're seeing that around the world, such extraordinary increases in extreme heat, drought, wildfire, heavy rains and flooding, stronger hurricanes and other kinds of tropical storms, because those tropical storms get their energy from warm ocean water. So we're warming up the oceans while we're warming up the atmosphere, and that's causing these, strong, these storms to be stronger and for more rain to fall in these very bad tropical storms. And we know that most of the damage in those storms actually comes from flooding more than wind and we're seeing much heavier rainfall from those storms. So yes, what we're seeing now, this is climate change. And there are direct linkages between everything we're seeing and the warming of the atmosphere and the oceans. And that is something that is much stronger in this new IPCC report that just came out than it ever has been before. It used to be scientists would say, well, we know the general trends are in this direction, but they were hesitant to directly connect any particular event with climate change. That's finished. We can now directly connect specific individual extreme events to climate change. And they run models where they compare this particular heat wave, for example, in a world before global warming and then in a world with global warming. And they look at the difference and that tells them how much of this particular event is attributable to human-caused global warming. So for example, they can say, this event was 20 times more likely to occur because of global warming, or this event was five degrees hotter than it would have been in the absence of global warming. So they can give us real specifics on both the frequency and intensity of these events because of our warming. So those linkages have gotten much stronger in this new report. Some days it's hard, I have to be honest. Um, when we see these events that are playing out and people dying and so much suffering, and we realize that this could have been avoided if we had taken action 20 years ago, instead of dragging our feet for so long, so much of this suffering could have been avoided. And that is really hard to take. However, there's an old proverb that says, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago but the second best time to plant it is now. And that's how I feel about action on warming. I wish we had taken action 20 years ago. We could have avoided so much of this, but we can't go back. All we can do is go forward. So we must become very focused. This has got to be our top priority. And I know that's hard in a world suffering with a pandemic, with economies collapsing, with so many other problems to deal with, but this problem makes every other problem worse. And so we've got to focus ourselves on this. And we've got to understand that the actions we need to take are affordable. They're good for us for so many other reasons. And we've got to overcome the societal inertia because there's also inertia in the climate system. And when we have to turn this giant tanker, we can't turn it on a dime. We've got to, it moves slowly. So we've got to begin now. And you know, some, some of the things that give me hope are the youth 
climate movement to see young people taking this on and saying, this is our future. And you say you love us, but look what you're doing to us. And so that gives me some hope that there's this strength, this energy coming from young people to really turn this around. And we've got a, another meeting of the countries coming up in Scotland soon. And I am really hopeful that they will make the kinds of commitments, the really firm commitments that we need to move forward and that we don't have the bickering between countries over who's more at fault and who's less at fault, that we have the wealthier countries helping the less wealthy countries to make this transition. They don't have to develop in the same dirty way that we did. Just like, for example, they didn't have telephones, so they didn't start the same way we did with the phone lines. They went straight to, they jumped over that technology and went straight to cell phones. The same can happen in energy. They don't have to build coal-fired power plants. They can go straight to solar and wind, which is less expensive, which is plentiful around the world, and which we know works. We've got to go with the things that we know work, and we've got to go with them now. We don't need a technological miracle. We've had that miracle. That miracle is how fast solar, wind, and battery storage have developed and come down in price, solar by 90% in the last decade alone. We've had that miracle. Now we need to implement it, and we need to do it fast. And so I've mentioned the things we need to do. No new fossil fuel infrastructure, electrify everything, clean up the grid, retire as quickly as possible all the fossil fuels out of our system and stop clearing tropical forests, stop filling and draining wetlands. Let nature help us. Nature helps us by absorbing lots of the carbon dioxide emissions that we put out. The oceans absorb them, the trees absorb them. But if we cut the trees down and if we get them all burning, they won't be able to help us as much. And if we saturate the oceans with carbon dioxide, we're acidifying the oceans and we're hurting all of the animal life living in the oceans and the plant life. So really, it's such a, it feels like such a big problem that sometimes it's hard to wrap our minds around, but it's not that complicated. We know what we need to do. And I've just sort of explained it in just a few minutes, right? We just need to do it. So that I think is the good news that the future is still in our hands. We get to choose a future with a little more warming that we can adapt to and deal with, or a lot more warming that presents us with a global catastrophe. I wear this because one of the things that we can do that's so important is to talk about this problem. You know, there's a lot of uh, sort of silence around this. People are nervous to talk about it. So I wear this because people ask me about it and I can tell them these are the global warming stripes. Every stripe here is one year of temperature from 1880 when we started to keep records to the present. And what you can clearly see is a clear global warming trend. It was used to be much cooler and now it's gotten hotter. And as we extend these stripes into the future, they get redder and darker. And so this, this is our world. This is global warming in a nutshell. So that's why I wear the pin. Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs>